we were talking about total hip precautions, and I think we'd gotten past this. So we had talked about premedicating them, um, not only treating when they have pain, but anticipating their pain and treating them before they go to physical therapy. Prevention and early detection of DVT. One of the best ways to prevent DVT is get up and get moving. And so that kind of goes along with this one is we want to make sure that they're walking in the halls if that's what's ordered or working with PT and not saying, oh, I hurt too bad to do my PT. That's the one of the best ways to prevent the DVT. Other things that we can do, TEDs and SCUDs. TEDs are um, sometimes called TED hoes, and they are these white, um, tight, kind of look like pantyhose things, except for they stop at the top of the leg, and those are excellent at preventing DVT. They have shown time and time again in very robust studies to decrease the risk of DVT. SCUDs, SCDs, um, they're called both. Those are the things, um, this stands for compression device, sequential compression device, and so those are hooked up to a motor, and so it has to plug in, and they kind of wrap around the legs. They have a Velcro fastener, and they're plastic, and then they kind of squeeze the legs. So it'll start at the ankle and squeeze, then release, and then it will squeeze around the calf and release. And they do that just by um, filling full of air. So it's kind of like a blood pressure cuff a little bit, but it's sequential. So it goes ankle, calf, upper calf, like that, and then it starts over again. And again, these have been shown time and time again in robust studies to really decrease the risk of DVT. We want to avoid pillows under the legs because this can um, put pressure in that one spot and allow blood to pool and this can actually increase the risk. If we absolutely have to put a pillow under the leg, we're going to turn it lengthwise so it's pretty much goes under the whole entire leg and then we can use it like that to kind of float the foot a little bit. But for the most part, you want to avoid pillows under the legs because that increases the risk of DVT. Have the patient flex and extend the toes, feet, and ankles hourly. We're going to assess for calf pain and maybe the home and signage shift. This used to be a staple when I was in nursing school, and you might still see this on some of your assessment sheets asking was the home and sign positive or negative, but it's kind of going out of fashion because research isn't backing it up as being a very good assessment tool. Just in case you still see it uh, someplace that you go to work for, home and sign is just we're assessing for calf pain when we dorsiflex the foot. So you kind of held their leg straight and push on the top part of the foot a little bit. And if they complain of that creating a sharp pain, then that'd be a positive home and sign. And then it needs to be followed up with um, something more detailed to see if there's a blood clot. Now we kind of just go by um, calf pain, and if one calf is having a lot more pain than the other calf, that's a pretty good sign that something's wrong. Early ambulation I already talked about up here. That's why we give them medicine. Anticoagulants like Lovenox will give Lovenox injections to the stomach, and probably within the first month of you doing clinicals, you will have given all the Lovenox you can ever hope to ever want to give. <laughs> You'll give lots of Lovenox at clinicals. It's just a sub-Q injection into the uh, tummy and they're pretty easy to do. Of course it does put them at increased risk for hemorrhage so when anytime someone's on a blood thinner yeah it's great for reducing the risk of DVT but we have to then keep, keep a closer eye on the incision make sure it doesn't start bleeding again because um, it increases the risk for hemorrhage there. Okay, you're going to get very familiar with these. This is part of the paperwork that you do in clinical, and this is called your priority problem plan or priority problem sheet. And we're going to be doing some in class and kind of build up a library for you. And so you won't really be turning these in, but you might be copying them. So I have three here that we're going to do together in class, and hopefully you can get a patient with a connective tissue disorder, such as... Um, recent hip surgery or knee surgery or something like that and you'll have this part done all you have to do is copy it so medical diagnosis is the first part here and post arthroplasty is what I chose for my medical diagnosis so they've had um, hip or knee replacement this would fit either one 
pathophysiology. I found that on page 9, 951 where it talks about arthroscopic surgery on, well, just under the pharmacology capsule. And so I summarize that. Arthroscopic surgery removes loose bodies and repairs defects and is the surgical treatment of choice for osteoarthritis of the hip or knee when intractable pain is present. Arthroplasty of the hip or knee involves total joint replacement. Now, here's the good part. These are already done for you in the book. So look on page 954 in that green box. In the third one down, it says impaired physical mobility. I copied that word for word, as you can see right here, and that's what a priority patient problem is. In this book, it's referred to as the nursing diagnosis. Nursing diagnosis and priority patient problem is essentially the same thing. So where we ask you to put the priority patient problem, if you can ever find nursing diagnosis in your book, that's what goes in that place. Now notice I left signs and symptoms blank. That's because I'm trying to make this something that you can use on multiple patients and so the signs and symptoms are going to be different from each patient. So this is one of the parts that you would have to fill in yourself just depending on the on the patient. So again, I, I don't want you to turn what we're doing now in. I just want you to keep it as a reference so that you can copy and you'll individualize it based on the patient that you're assigned. So this part you'll just have to fill in based on their signs and symptoms. The goal, again, I copied it word for word right there from page 954 across from impaired physical mobility. It says physical mobility without complications of immobility um, and then all the rest of this stuff. That's um, a great goal or outcome and this type of writing, it's okay to copy. I know you've been told about plagiarism and, and that, oh, that's cheating, but Care plans are meant to be, or priority problem plans, they're meant to be copied. So don't be afraid to copy it word for word. That's that's what they're for. It's There's actually, well, I'll get into it in, in um, clinical. Now is not the time. But that's we're supposed to copy care plans. That's We're not supposed to invent them on our own. So interventions. The green ones don't have the interventions with them. But as you'll see on our next one, some of them do. But the interventions are in the text. So on page 955, you see right in the middle of the page, it says impaired physical mobility in bold. And I picked out all of my interventions from that paragraph right there. So the first one I found was about three, four sentences down. It says reposition the patient as allowed. And so I copied that. I added every two hours because that's typically when we're going to reposition a patient. Next, I have inspect pressure areas for redness. And in your book, it says inspect inspecting pressure areas for redness caused by circulatory impairment. Well, there it gives me the rationale right behind it. So I put inspect pressure er areas for redness here. Circulatory impairment increases the risk for pressure ulcers. Catching areas early makes treatment easier. Up here, the rationale I came up with came from page 328 and if nothing else these are going to get you to where you just know this book forwards and backwards and you're going to wear this book out before you finish nursing school you might have to duct tape it together but that's that's a good thing good thing so if you go to page 328 in your book keep your hand in this place you see that the chapter title is chapter 21 immobility so there's a whole entire chapter on immobility and if we look down on 328 under skin integrity, very last part of the page, it has my rationale right there that I've underlined. Pressure ulcers are a localized area of, and here's where I start copying, tissue no necrosis that develop when soft tissue is compressed between a bony, bony prominence and an external surface. So I copied that right in my rationale. So the rationale is just explaining why the intervention will work. So then keep a hand there, go back to page 955 and the next thing we have we have reposition inspect pressure areas for redness coach and support the patient during coughing and deep breathing exercises and use of this incident spirometer and if you read the very next sentence it has our next um, intervention auscultate that means listen with your stethoscope auscultate for breath sounds to detect atelectasis or retain secretions 
And so I put the, those are those are two different interventions. So coach and support patient during coughing and deep breathing exercises, auscultate for breath sounds, and then the very next sentence after that tells us why. It says to prevent atelectasis or retained secretions. So or to detect. So I put the to detect here. Here I put to prevent because the coughing, deep breathing prevents it. Auscultating detects it. Then back to page 955. It says um, inspect and palpate the abdomen for bowel or bladder distension, which I put here. And then I skipped the next one about administer IV fluids because we're not going to do that very often. But then the last sentence, give stool softeners and laxatives as ordered, is my last intervention here. And then I flip back to mobility chapter on page 334 to get my rationales. Like I said, you're really going to get good at using this book. So on page 334, um, it talks about urinary incontinence. And the uh, one, two, third sentence, when the body is in a reclining position, the kidney must force urine into the ureters against the pull of gravity. So there's my rationale right there, which I put here. I didn't have room to really address the bowel distension, but the next one does. Why would I give stool softeners? Why is that going to help? And then again on page 333, our textbook says, under constipation, Constipation is one of the most common problems associated with immobility. So that's how you do um, a priority problem plan right there. You use your book and then your responses. Again, I left that blank because I don't know what the responses are going to be. It's your patient. That's going to be what the patient did. Let's look at another one. So this one was on page 952. So there, that says nursing care plan, most of that page, patient with a total hip replacement. And as you look at this one, you can see we have a nursing diagnosis, goals and outcomes, and then the interventions are written right there. So these are even easier, and all chapters have these. So even though we don't use these a lot on our exams, this, these are the ones that you're going to use in clinical. And so make sure you bring these books with you to clinical because this is what we're going to be using to do your clinical. So I chose risk for injury related to unsteady gait. That's um, the second one down. And again, it has my goal right there. The patient will experience no falls during hospitalization. So this is about falls. Now I went ahead and put some signs and symptoms on this one just to show you what kinds of things you might put here. History of falls, wheelchair use, incontinence, because they're going to hop up and want to go to the bathroom. Diminished mental status, polypharmacy, that means they take a whole bunch of drugs that might interact with one another. So those are signs and symptoms. You don't copy those from the book because they come from your patient that you're going to be assessing. So we got our problem, our goal, and then the interventions are written right there. I just fill in the blanks. Assist the patient in and out of bed. Place the call light within easy reach. Check frequently for patients in need for change of position. Provide assistive devices, and I specified what they are as ordered. And again, these are just coming right from the book. And then I put some more because this is probably the most common priority problem plan you're going to do because almost every patient you encounter is high risk for falls. So whenever you're having a bad week and you think you just don't have time to do a good care plan, just whip out your fall and turn in a fall <laughs> priority problem plan. Get a good grade. It makes it easy. Um, bed in low position and use bed and chair alarm to alert staff when the patient gets up without assistance are two more that weren't in your book here, but um, we'll talk about later on. So then we have to provide the rationales. They're going to match the intervention. Why does assisting the patient in and out of bed help prevent a fall? Well, it provides the patient with improved stability and balance. Placing the call light within easy reach. How's this going to prevent a fall? Because stretching to get items out of that are out of reach can disrupt balance and contribute to falls. Checking frequently for patients need to change position. Why is that going to prevent falls? Well, patients who whose needs go unmet are more likely to get out of bed without assistance. And so you can see each rationale matches up with the intervention. 
um, why do we want to pro provide